Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Tech Talk, Accelerate Analytics and Machine Learning in the Hybrid Cloud Era. Before I introduce you to, to our speakers, I've got a few housekeeping items. All participants are automatically on mute throughout the session. We will be using the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen to communicate. In today's session, our speakers will give a brief presentation followed by a Q&A session at the end so we can answer all of your questions. Again, to ask a question, simply submit your question under the question section in the GoToWebinar control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. And don't hesitate to send your questions anytime. No need to wait till the end. I will be monitoring the questions box throughout. Lastly, today's session is being recorded and will be available for on-demand playback. We will email you the presentation slides as well. So that's it for the housekeeping items. Uh, without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Alex, Bar uh, Alex Ma, who's our Director of Solutions Engineering, and Peter Barakis, who's the Director at Aluxio. Without further ado, passing it on to you, Peter. Good day to everybody. This is Peter Barakis. Hopefully you can all see my screen. I'll be monitoring and uh, kind of going through the front part of this presentation, handing off to Alex, and then we'll do Q&A like uh, Amelia had just mentioned. So what are we gonna cover today? We're gonna talk about the market, and this is where we hope we get some nodding of heads from you that you see what we see out there in the big data analytics world and some of the challenges and aspirations you might have and market trends. We'll talk a bit about the Alexio vision, you know, why does Alexio exist? What was the basis for starting the company? When just what is data orchestration as we know it? And then we'll talk a little bit about how Alexio might be able to help you. So on the market side, you know, data lakes and silos are everywhere. You know, Hadoop came out probably over 10 years ago, and it was the big data place to put your data. And it could take structured, unstructured, semi-structured data. But we fast forward 10 to 12 years, and you have old data, older legacy types of data warehouses like Teradata. You might have your own internal applications. Of course, you've got file and databases everywhere. You might have started to use the public cloud. You've got one or two versions of Hadoop in your environment, and you may have on-prem or in the cloud S3. In other words, data lakes and data silos have grown organically or have been added into the organization by acquisition. And there's been a lot of money and time spent trying to consolidate and consolidate, a lot of money and time. And what we've realized in calling on customers is it may not really ever end for a lot of people. It's just too big a project. And one of the reasons why Alexio exists is to um, enable people to run their business at a faster speed, get analytics faster without having to do a lot of the data management and movement to put everything in one data lake, which is where you know, a lot of this started uh, many, many years ago. The trends we see that seem to be driving the need for new architecture are separation of compute and storage. There's a lot of benefits to that. Uh, when it was combined in one stack, it worked pretty good, but as things progressed and data became bigger, faster, and more variety, core organizations needed separate hardware and software stacks to do the job, hence silos, right? And if you add in the use of the cloud for either compute or storage or both, things are getting separated from a company's data centers and in the cloud use they may have. It's truly a multi-cloud environment, and we could say multi-cloud in that it's one cloud location and it could be two data center locations for a company. The other part is the rise of the object. You know, object is always known to be slow, but object is now uh, starting to become more of a, a more of the data lake in lieu of Hadoop, as we see it across a number of companies. And companies want to do self-service. You know, the, the cloud over the last 10 years has had a lot of effect on how we interact with data and do our jobs or even run our personal lives. And the notion of just going to a site and getting everything there without knowing where the data is and where the compute is, is very much what's expected in corporate America today. So the whole notion of self-service is a big thing, but, but how do you do that when you have all these silos with different data locations, right? So I'll just summarize, and I, I'd like to think some of you will nod your heads to this to some degree. 
Um, the, the volume and velocity and variety of data is, is still avalanching. If you read the fourth industrial revolution, it'll tell you it's doubling every two years, every two and a half years, there's twice as much data. So whatever we're doing to enable and instrumenting all these things out in the universe, it's coming back in, in ways that, that can be bearing us in the form of the data sets that we, we're, we're seeing. And the business has seen how a data lake can benefit them doing analytics. So now their expectations are much higher moving forward in the fourth industrial revolution compared to what they, there might have been when they were just using Teradata back in you know, 2005. And, and that's the only way for a company to compete fairly, right? If you read that fourth industrial revolution, it'll tell you, you know, models, analytics, speed of analytics, you know, speed at which you can ingest, analyze, and act or the things that are, make people relevant to remain relevant or not. We're seeing the Hadoop investments start to be replaced by cloud and object, whether, in, whether it's on-premise object or cloud. We're seeing uh, it's a multi-cloud world and we just don't see it changing. There are companies who have lifted and shifted, but if they're of a decent size, it's very, very difficult. And I, I would submit to you that it's probably only a small percentage of the, of the large enterprises that are out there. Technical leadership that we talk to, they want the ability and agility to run applications anywhere to sustain their operations regardless of what's happening underneath so they can provide that self-service um, to their, their consumers or their users, whether it's paying customers or internal employees of the company. And everybody we talk to is, is struggling to keep up with the data ingest and the business demands. It's just more and more data and there's more and more demands and again, it's a faster velocity of expectation on analytics and time to action. And from a cost standpoint, data is being produced, data is being ingested, and to fuel the analytics and machine learning, it's typically being copied to the location where the compute is, which can be very expensive, take a lot of time, and be a lot of overhead for people. So hopefully, you're nodding your head going, we have some of that, and that would, that would align with what we see when we call on on our customers. So Alexio's vision, orchestrate data for analytics and machine learning to enable companies to grow and be agile regardless of where the data and computer located. That's a big, that's a big idea, right? And allow companies to quick start cloud adoption that optimizes costs and yields two to five X faster analytics. And this isn't, obviously there's many, many use cases, but some of the top things that come to mind with our retail customers and our banking customers is fraud protection. I mean, if you can do it two times faster and you can analyze more data two times faster, doesn't it give you twice the chance to be able to find the fraud and shut it down before it you know, has more impact? I, we would say yes. And our retail customers like Walmart and JD.com would, would, would agree with you. I mean, in regards to research for treatments for diseases in life sciences, right? I mean, if you can analyze the data twice as fast or three times faster, doesn't that mean your time to vaccine or time to treatment is that much faster? And that's a big thing for a lot of us, right? And then finally, uptime for all industrial and digital technology that we depend on, whether it's you know, bridges, whether it's um, manufacturing, I mean, anything that we would depend on mechanically and physically that's out there that's now been instrumented and now it's called IoT that's giving off signals from traffic lights, et cetera, on, you know, oil rigs, et cetera, all of that that we depend on and we want to optimize now can run a lot more effectively if we can just accelerate it, right? And when I think of the research, I mean, running the human genome used to take X amount of computers and cycles, like six months or a year back at a certain point in time. Now with, with the power of computing and the speed at which we can compute, you know, we can do, we can run a genome in hours, right? And not days or months or weeks. That's a big thing to accelerate testing and the associated results. So uh, if you go to our website, you'll see this. What is data orchestration? a platform that brings your data closer to compute across clusters, regions, clouds, and countries. Meaning our goal as a data orchestration company is to make sure wherever your compute's happening in the cloud, multiple clouds, multiple sites of your data centers, that we're gonna make sure just the right data is there to optimize the compute and accelerate the results. 
we have customers. There's a lot of people who found this out over the last five years. Uh, we've been offering um, Alexia's data orchestration. If you look in retail, there's a number of companies. Financial services, a number of companies. Consumer tech, there are, there, you know, there's, over, there's hundreds of customers that, that we have that use Alexia today in production. And it's across most, most verticals. So what do they use Alexio to do to get down to the next level? I mean, fundamentally, there's really, I'd say, three big reasons captured in two bullets. One is they're just seeing a sluggish analytics process. And they, they, their business is demanding they get, they get the results faster, plain and simple. It's just, it's just about performance. And as Alex will get into it, you'll see we're able to do this with our advanced and intelligent caching technology. The other big win is there's a lot of data being moved around, and you saw that silo slide that I showed early on in the presentation. You know, how do you get data from one to another to another? It's a lot of work, and you can write APIs and try to do one-time connections, but most people are just copying, syncing, and, and, and uh, migrating data. And it's for data admin and data engineering, it's a lot of work to fuel the growing demands of the analytics pipelines, right? So we dramatically lower that by having a unified namespace uh, with APIs that connect disparate storage to compute. And I'll show you a slide that, that kind of highlights that. For you people who are using the cloud as one of their sites, as a multi-cloud or a hybrid cloud environment, oftentimes they dramatically lower their data egress costs coming out of the cloud going to on-premise compute to drive those analytics pipelines. So there can be some big financial gains. And we'll also say, if you're getting two to five X faster, that means if you're doing compute in the cloud and it's, it's taking half the time or 20% of the time, that means your compute costs with the cloud uh, partner are gonna be lower too. And of course, we have to be able to drop into whatever on-prem or cloud environments there are without any barrier to entry or what we call zero programming, or else it would mitigate the value that we're providing. This culminates really in a pictorial of what it is we do, right? We offer a unified namespace, meaning we've identified all the different types of storage that our customers might have, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud or multiple clouds. And we know how to we put that into our cache, we act as a caching layer or an abstraction layer, and we virtualize all your data, no matter where it is, no matter what storage type, and we present that to the compute environment you might have, which you see at the top. And we pull in just the data that's needed for that particular compute job or jobs. Clearly, if common data is being pulled into our cache for a Spark job that might be used by a Presto job, or even within Spark jobs, that's where you'll get incredible acceleration because the data is already in the compute framework or near the compute framework. So at this time, I'm gonna pass it off to Alex Ma, who's gonna take you the rest of the way before we get into question and answer time. Thank you so much. Alex? Hey, hey thanks, Peter. So uh, that was a great overview. I think what we'll do now is start digging into some of the approaches um, that people have used for this kind of pattern of hybrid cloud and look at some of the challenges uh, that come with those approaches and look at how Luxio can help make this process a whole lot easier. Um, so next slide, Peter. So there's, there's several ways uh, that we see people try to, to start leveraging the cloud when they've got a lot of data that's either you know, already an, ex an existing data lake in their data center uh, or you know something else and so these are the three mechanisms that we typically see uh, people doing lift and shift copying data by workload or just trying to cache data in the cloud itself and you know with some of these approaches um, they can be you know some, sometimes more problematic than others so when we start talking about lift and shift um, one of the things that we see is that you know, taking a workload that's been historically just running in a data center and just converting that straight to cloud, uh, that can be a little bit costly because sometimes these things are not, you know, tailor-made for you know, cloud environments and they're, they're made to run, you know, 24 by 7. They're, they're made to be run, you know, in a fairly static configuration. And so 
it can be a little challenging to just kind of lift the entire application up uh, without kind of optimizing it for how things work in the cloud itself. Um, the other challenge is that oftentimes the data that these applications leverage, you know, they're tied into an entire ecosystem of, of things that are used to generate the data, cleanse the data, filter the data, and other processes that might, um, you know, access the data for reporting or analytics or, or other processes. And so it's, it makes it very challenging to just say, hey, we're going we're gonna to migrate this application up into the cloud and start leveraging it when there are a bunch of different things that are generating the data or reading the data uh, that are still on-prem. Uh, and so keeping that data available you know, in the cloud makes it challenging because you, you've got to figure out a way to sync it back with the on-premise data. Um, copying data by a workload, you know, uh, sometimes we're able to identify you know, hey, this one specific data set um, you know, out of the lake is what we want to, to leverage. Um, you know, that can be interesting as well um, because you have tools like DISCP uh, or the S3 tools that can let you, you know, easily migrate this stuff into the cloud. Um, but again, the challenge comes into play that, you know, this is uh, often harder, <laughs> harder to do than, than the reality. You know, uh, it's not always easy to identify a specific data set uh, or a portion of the data set. Right? Um, sometimes what this means is that, you know, an application may leverage, we've seen anywhere from 1% to 10% of the total data set. And without being able to identify, you know, where that 1% or 10% comes from, uh, it makes it challenging to, to, to get that up into the cloud. And so oftentimes what we see is, you know, they're, they're trying to migrate the entire thing or copy the entire thing up into the cloud. It's going to be very expensive. Uh, and this still comes with the syncing challenges, right? Uh, the last approach that we see is uh, people pulling data into the cloud based on requests from the compute. Now, this is, uh, this is a good approach, but it's less helpful for workloads that, you know, uh, aren't doing multiple reads of the data. Uh, so this is typically helpful for things like ad hoc querying, but for ETL workloads, for any number of other things, uh, it can be less beneficial to just have something specifically caching data in the cloud itself. Uh, so next slide, Peter. Okay, uh, next. Okay, so, so right. So what we're looking at, uh, the initial problem statement, is you know we've got a, a cluster, uh, a data lake, HDFS, that lives in our data center, uh, and it's at its scaling limit in terms of the amount of hardware and resources that we want to throw at it, and you know uh, things are not good. We want to leverage, we want to leverage new environments for for other things. Right? And so if you uh, go back a click, Peter. So if we if we start to look at you know how you might go about leveraging you know the cloud, uh, the challenges that come up are, are some of the things that we talked about earlier, right? So one is just the sheer physics of it. Uh, the network throughput and the network latency make uh, make these kind of hybrid configurations uh, not very scalable. You're talking about leveraging you know a 40 gig or 100 gig direct connect link to actually be able to do some of this stuff, you know, uh, and, and that gets very expensive very fast. Uh, the second is again, you know, similar to, to what we talked about earlier. You know, it's difficult to maintain copies of the data. It's expensive to copy the full data set into the cloud. Uh, it's costly to try to figure out how to sync this data back and forth, uh, and, and which is the source of truth. And so, what we get to, you know, in terms of solving some of these problems is Alexio. Uh, if you can click next, Peter. And so with Alexio, what we get is a hybrid cloud solution that allows you to essentially burst compute into the cloud while maintaining your data lake on premise, uh, or you know, maybe if not on premise, in the process of migrating to the cloud itself. And so what Alexio allows you to do is run these frameworks like Spark or Presto or TensorFlow in the cloud, let them have access to the working set of data, which again is, is probably going to be anywhere from 1% to 10% of your overall data set, and let these frameworks have access to it as if it were local, right? Uh, giving them the performance that they, you know, uh, they need, 
uh, not spending time on expensive network transfer continuously. Uh, all of this is kind of automatically synced with the data that's on premise. Uh, so there's not a concern for, you know, uh, I've got this data in the cloud and this data on prem and they're, they're completely different, right? The second thing that we're able to do is we're not only able to, to allow you to leverage these kind of hybrid scenarios, but we're also able to help with the online migration of data uh, by policy. And so essentially the way it works is that as data is accessed, what you have the ability to do is say, hey, you know, after this data has been accessed for 30 days, uh, after 30 days after this data has been accessed, I want you to copy it to the cloud or I want you to move it completely to the cloud uh, off of HDFS. And so it's a really interesting capability that we can use to start uh, populating cloud data lakes. Next slide. So we'll take a look at, um, you know, a little bit about a couple ways that customers have actually leveraged uh, Alexio in this kind of configuration. And the first one that we're going to look at is Walmart. So Walmart is actually leveraging this up in Google Cloud and using this to provide a ad hoc querying platform uh, using uh, Presto and tapping into multiple HDFS clusters that live in their different data centers. Now, this is a really interesting use case because it supports, uh, again, a very wide number of users uh, at a very scalable rate. Uh, so there's several thousand users that are supported using this. And if you can click to the next slide, Peter. What we're able to do is offer a performance increase right, in terms of just the sheer number of query, uh, the, the, the sheer latency of how fast these queries take to run. And we're also able to run with higher concurrency, supporting more users. And so I forget exactly the, the exact numbers, but I think it is around something like 3,200 users spread out over 40 business units that are leveraging this environment in the cloud to gain more insights. You can go next. Uh, the next interesting use case is Adobe. And Adobe is interesting in the sense that um, they're running a hybrid cloud, but it's uh, a very different kind of configuration. Um, they essentially ran out of space in their main data center, uh, had a, a very large multi-petabyte warehouse in that site, uh, and plenty of space in a new data center that they had fired up. And what they ended up doing uh, was running Presto and Spark SQL uh, in the remote data center using Alexio to cache data from you know, the original site. And what they saw were some really interesting results. Um, uh, essentially, their original solution leveraged Hive on top of the data, and Presto and Spark, you know, in a remote site, uh, without access to the data, are able to generate uh, query performance that's about 3x of uh, what they were seeing with the original solution. A lot of that comes from, you know, leveraging the new frameworks, Presto and Spark SQL, uh, but a lot of it also comes from, you know, being able to do it with Alexio as well. Um, and so, again, you see something similar to, to Walmart, you know, better query latency uh, and increased concurrency so being able to essentially support a larger amount of users in a scalable manner. And so um, something really interesting with, uh, with Adobe. Uh, next slide, please. Great. And then the next one that we're looking at <coughs> is Electronic Arts. And they're essentially doing, uh, again, you see a common, common theme here. We're helping to accelerate Presto and ad hoc queries. Uh, and this one is a little bit different. Uh, in this one, they are using Alexio uh, to perform caching for AWS S3, and all of this is running in the cloud. And so what they've been able to benefit from is from a few of the features in Alexio that allow them to improve the performance of Presto when working with a, a large number of small files and reduce the cost to S3. Um, a lot of people think of the cost of S3 as essentially, you know, how much data am I storing in there? And that's definitely one component of the cost itself. But another large component actually comes from uh, metadata access. Um, and I forget exactly um, what that translates into. I think it's uh, S3 uh, file, file and directory listings. Uh, but these calls can be very costly 
uh, in the cloud environment. Uh, one of the things that we learned is that when Presto is doing some of these queries, uh, it can make anywhere up to 100,000 uh, API calls for a single query to capture metadata for all the different RK files and, and different you know, partitions that it's trying to um, you know, query data off of. Uh, and those calls uh, contribute to the cost of the overall cost of you know, running this in S3. And so what they were able to, to discover is that um, you know, using Alexio as not only a cache for the data, but also as a cache for the metadata calls, they're able to drop their S3 costs by about a third um, just by leveraging this solution. So, uh, next slide. Great. So we spent a little bit of time talking about, you know, uh, the kind of trend that we see in the industry, uh, what hybrid clouds are, and, you know, some of the customers that are benefiting from, you know, this kind of solution. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about how this thing works from a mechanics standpoint. Um, to give you a better understanding of if this is going to be a fit for you and, and uh, help speed that process along. So, you know, the first thing that we're going to look at from a feature standpoint is uh, data locality. And what Alexio is able to do is it's able to install co-located with these frameworks and leverage resources that would otherwise be unused uh, and use that to provide data locality. And so in this example, we've got, you know, Alexio, and it can be, you know, uh, installed on any, any given thing, right? And these, these, the application frameworks will all want for different resources on the system. Uh, and so in the case of some of these, what we're able to do is we're able to leverage uh, the leftover memory, unused SSD, or unused HDD, and tell Alexio, hey, I want you to take advantage of, you know, n number of tiers to provide data locality and caching. And so that Alexio worker, you know, is, is pretty flex flexible in terms of how it's configured. Uh, you can configure it to just use RAM and SSD or just HDD, you know, whatever it is that you have available. And it will intelligently manage the, tier, uh, the access of the data and move from tier to tier as needed. And so what this can result in is that, you know, the, the, the hot frequently accessed data that is being used by any of these applications, uh, those will typically be in the memory tier uh, or the highest or fastest tier, if you will. And the data that is queried semi-frequently or, or, or rarely uh, will end up living on a slower tier, SSD or HDD. And Alexio manages all of that for you transparently. And so it's a really interesting way to take advantage of, you know, the, the capacities on these machines. Uh, users like Adobe, um, users like Analytics have learned that, you know, you can have uh, tens of terabytes of storage on the local machine, even though it may not be the most performant in terms of, you know, if it's just a regular spinning disk, it's still a lot faster than reaching out over the network uh, to a remote source and transferring all that data over. And so it can be uh, uh, quite interesting in terms of uh, how it provides that locality of data for these different applications. Go next. Okay. And so the other interesting question that we get uh, quite frequently is, you know, well, how, how do I know that I have you know, the most recent data? Um, and what Alexio does is it taps into uh, the default synchronization mechanisms that are available for some of these stores uh, for something like HDFS, which is, you know, probably 90% of what we see in terms of a storage medium, uh, there's a mechanism called iNotify. Uh, and we tie into that, and that essentially allows us to stay up to date with the writes that are happening uh, on that remote store and understand if we have the current data or if this data has changed and we need to fetch it from HDFS to be able to service you know, a current request. Uh, and again, you have control. Uh, one of the things you'll learn with Alexio is that you have a, a lot of granularity and a lot of control for how these things are done. So you can specify any number of uh, different options uh, based on what you're trying to, to, to guarantee from a uh, consistency standpoint. Next slide. Um, so the first thing that I'll talk about with this slide, because this slide will actually look at a couple things, 
uh, is the second main feature in Alexio, and, and that is its ability to provide a unified namespace. And so if we look at this tree, there's a lot of things going on here, but if we look at the green boxes, um, this is essentially how Alexio presents data to applications. Um, they're accessing Alexio on a given host and a given port, and those applications will see a file system hierarchy that looks like what we see, you know, right here in the green. You know, they'll see, you know, off of Slash, we have data and users, and underneath that, we have reports, sales, Alice, and Bob. Um, and the fact is, is that Alexio provides a unified namespace to these applications to abstract away the fact that, you know, this is actually made up of, you know, a remote HDFS data lake, as well as an S3 bucket. And you can see that HDFS is mounted to the root of Alexio, and it's able to show, you know, users, Alice and Bob, and that S3 is mounted as what we call a nested bucket, uh, or sorry, nested mount point in Alexio, and it presents as data, reports, and sales. And so with this, you can actually change out these layers as you, as you go on. And you can do this without making any kind of application change, uh, because Alexio is essentially able to shim its way in transparently um, to these paths and uh, allow applications to continue accessing data, you know, even if you change the underlying storage mechanisms. And so we have users that, um, you know, are using Alexio to migrate up to S3, and as they migrate, they're able to, to leverage this kind of configuration. And after they're finished migrating, uh, they're able to, again, continue to, to leverage this uh, just by simply changing one of the mount options uh, for Alexio applications can continue accessing data as needed. Um, the other interesting thing about this is that we actually have the ability to mount multiple storage locations to the same path. And what that gives us the ability to do is essentially um, uh, bias the read towards a particular one. In this case, you can see that HDFS and S3 are mounted to the data directory. Um, we can tell Alexio to, to serve reads by default for that partition, or sorry, for that mount point by default from HDFS and fall back on S3 if the data is not there. And what that allows us to do is actually specify policies uh, on that mount point so that uh, in this case, if data is older than seven days, we're going to migrate it over from HDFS to S3. Uh, so again, a very interesting way to start the population of uh, a cloud data lake. Uh, next slide. All right. So if you've been curious kind of what this looks like in terms of physical layout, uh, like we talked about before, uh, Alexio is typically installed co-located with these application frameworks. And so here we have an example of an Alexio cluster that spanned over two different compute frameworks. And so we have multiple Spark workers, we have multiple Presto workers, and Alexio is installed on each of them. And Alexio is configured to leverage the memory, the SSD and the HDD uh, on these local machines. Uh, Alexio is also configured to mount uh, an HDFS data lake, as well as an S3-based object store. Now, in terms of the flow of data, you know, for how things get requested, um, each of these application servers have an Alexio client local on them, and the Alexio client is used to, to talk to the entire cluster. And so, in the case of Presto, uh, I'll just give a, a walkthrough uh, of that one. You know, Presto might say, hey, I want to do uh, this query against this table. Uh, and it will get information from Hive or Glue that tells it, hey, all of this data is located in, in this location, you know, uh, and if it'll, it'll say Alexio or it'll say S3 or HDFS, and Alexio is able to kind of seamlessly translate that to an Alexio location. And so what will happen is the Alexio client will say, for that Presto worker will say, you know, hey, I need access to this specific table, which maps to this path. Uh, and this specific partition within the table and these specific files within that partition. And so it'll reach out to the Luxio master and the Luxio master will say, hey, I have this data, it's, it's located on worker one. Uh, you can service the request from worker one or it will say, I do not have that data. And if it does not have that data, what it will do is it will leverage a local Luxio worker to reach out to wherever that data might live, fetch the data, 
stored in one of the Alexio tiers and serves the request. And so it makes it very, very seamless for this application, Presto, to access that data uh, and, and fetch the current data if it doesn't have it, uh, or service the existing data if, if consistency is um, is not is is prioritized under um, throughput or latency. Next slide. So Alexio also has a catalog service, and I think one of the interesting things is you know working in these big data environments, uh, sometimes you see kind of impotence mismatches. Um, you see all these things centered around files and blocks. And, and other things. And then you see all these applications leveraging things as, as tables or catalogs. And so the Alexio catalog service is meant to, to, again, help simplify that, help optimize it. And so what it does is it provides the abstraction layer not only for you know, storage layers, but also for databases. Uh, and right now we support Hive as well as Glue in AWS. And if you click Next, what this uh, functionality helps with uh, is it helps provide optimizations uh, because we can be a little bit more aware of the schema and it can greatly simplify the deployment of a Luxio in some of these environments where you have a very large number of you know, tables, schemas, databases that are already created that you'd like to leverage with a Luxio itself. Next slide. All right. And so in terms of the optimizations, uh, two of the things that we can help with are uh, around transforming the data um, as well as coalescing the data. And coalescing is kind of interesting. Uh, some of these frameworks will obviously work with you know, whatever it is that you give them, uh, but oftentimes these things start out as CSVs, right? Common separated values. And so with these, um, one very simple optimization is instead of querying against a very large number of CSV files, querying against a smaller number of them. And Alexio can be used to kind of automatically coalesce these files. Um, another thing that it can do is that oftentimes these CSV files, they're very expensive to read because you're reading the entire file. Uh, they're not optimized for these querying frameworks, uh, but column, column, column format files like Parquet or ORC uh, are going to be a much more optimal way to go about doing this, but they can be very expensive to generate. And typically, you're you're looking at some kind of ETL process, whether it's Spark or MapReduce, to generate these files for you. And Alexio can actually help by automatically converting CSV files to Parquet to again optimize the experience for you in an automatic way. You go next. So in this case. What we do is we uh, attach an existing Hive database uh, into the Alexio catalog, and Alexio then is able to service the request for any of the tables or any of the databases within there to Apache Presto, or not, not Apache Presto, but uh, Presto. And from there, what we're able to do is further optimize by coalescing these files from a CSV format into a Parquet format and what we can see with this is a dramatic reduction in terms of times. So starting at the beginning, we're looking at 20 seconds to query against a very large number of files. Uh, after that's been transformed uh, from CSV, from many CSVs to less CSVs and then to Parquet, uh, we see this dropping down to seven seconds. And when we have Alexio caching the data itself, we see it dropping further down to three seconds. So, um, you know, all these things uh, add up in terms of optimizations and help to just streamline the efficiency in your environment for serving these kinds of requests and doing more with the you know, same amount of hardware that you might have. Next slide, please. All right, so that was, uh, that was a, a quick overview, a high level of, you know, kind of Alexio, uh, hybrid cloud platforms, uh, as well as some customers that, that have been using it. Let's you know, stop for a minute and uh, we'll take some questions. Thanks, Alex. So first question I see is how would I configure Alexio to work with my existing Metastore 
We have a large number of tables and schemas defined. Gotcha. So um, the way that um, this question is framed, um, you know, so in something like Hive, you'll have a table definition uh, under a schema, and that table will say, hey, the data is located on this HDFS path or this S3 path. And the question is, you know, how do I, how do I get Alexia to actually work with that? And we actually have two different options. Uh, one is the catalog service that we just mentioned, uh, and that can be used as a very quick way to, to, to integrate Alexio into the existing you know, table and schema definitions and be aware of it. Um, the second way is we have something called transparent URI uh, that's essentially a shim file system implementation that Presto, Spark, or Hadoop can all leverage. Uh, and essentially what it does is it translates the call for an HDFS path or an S3 path or, or whatever path uh, into the correct Alexio path. And so it's a driver that essentially works seamlessly with Alexio to transparently convert um, an existing location into the corresponding Alexio location. So that again, you're not looking at, you know, renaming all of these things or changing location of all these things to be able to leverage Alexio. Great. See, does Alexio work with machine learning? Yes, yes, it definitely does. Um, so there's a bunch of different frameworks that you might use for machine learning. Uh, Apache Spark, TensorFlow, uh, a bunch of different Python-based, you know, machine learning tools. Uh, we actually have one customer that's doing machine learning with with uh, Presto, but uh, in in all of these things machine learning is done with training data. And this training data, uh, the machine learning models are kind of, you know, they're, they're run iteratively over this data set, you know, many, many times. Uh, we have one customer that's doing, I think, a thousand iterations uh, before they actually end up with a optimized model. And so with this, uh, one of the things that you're trying to do is you're essentially trying to keep uh, that GPU uh, fed as quickly as possible. And so Alexa is you know, a great addition for this because essentially what it does is it helps offload you know, a lot of the network I.O. Uh, and a lot of the just I.O. in general and allow you know, these frameworks to keep the GPU fed with data as fast as, you know, fast as physically possible. And so uh, it can be a really great thing for machine learning. We have one customer um, that was able to essentially drop down the time for model creation by 4x with Alexio. And so the end result is that they're essentially able to generate four times as many models a year uh, using Alexio to essentially cache uh, the training data sets for machine learning. So, so yes, uh, it could be great for machine learning workloads. Okay, yeah, that's great. Well, what about uh, working with Dataproc? Google. Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, working with Dataproc uh, or EMR, uh, these are different frameworks uh, in the different cloud environments. Right? So Dataproc is specific to Google Cloud, EMR is specific to uh, Amazon Web Service, and what these are are essentially uh, easier ways to get up and running with things in the Hadoop ecosystem uh, in those cloud environments. And so it drastically simplifies, um, you know, getting a Hadoop cluster or a cluster with Spark or Presto uh, or any number of other things uh, up and running in those environments. And so, uh, yes, Alexio does work with those. Uh, in both cases, we tie into uh, those frameworks bootstrap mechanisms to um, make Alexio essentially a part of that installation. Uh, and ease the path forward for getting up and running. Uh, if you go to our docs page, uh, uh, EMR and Dataproc are actually spelled out as you know, very specific uh, tutorials for how to get up and running uh, in either environment with Alexio. That's great. So you mentioned earlier that some people are moving away from Hadoop is that something that you're seeing a lot of? 
Uh, yeah, I, I think what one of the things that we see are people with very large data lakes uh, that they've built up, you know, over the last five, ten years, and we see a trend in in people wanting to leverage uh, things like object stores uh, for a number of different reasons. You know, it, it's a simpler thing to manage. Uh, it's less costly. It's more scalable for them to to manage storage uh, and compute separately. Um, so we do generally see a trend toward this, but you know, one of the other trends that we see is that when they start down this path, uh, they're still they're still hoping for HDFS-like performance. You know, they've gotten used to this performance that they've had with HDFS, and they're not quite seeing it with uh, you know the various different object stores, uh, even with things like uh, Google Cloud Store or Amazon S3. Um, you, you just don't get the same kind of performance that you had with HDFS. And so Alexio, again, can be a great uh, benefit in this kind of environment because what it allows you to do is migrate off of HDFS and get HDFS-like performance um, you know, when you're using that object store. And, and so it can be a very interesting capability for these companies to leverage uh, that are looking to, to move their storage over to something that's going to be more scalable for them in the long run. So if someone's using Aluxio today and it's accelerating Hadoop in a hybrid environment and they want to move to S3, is there any work, work that has to be done? The question's a little cryptic, sorry. Um, is there any work that, is there any changes that have to be made or what, what does Aluxio, what does Aluxio do in that? environment. You said it's faster. I think I'm editorializing now. You said it's faster, but is there any, does the compute framework know any difference between what storage is when it's a dupe or S3? I mean, there, there's going to be mechanical differences in, in some of these things, right? Because an object store is obviously not um, a, a file store, uh, kind of it, it's less similar to something like HDFS. So some operations become more expensive. Um, but again, a lot of these things are abstracted away by Aluxio. Um, so I'll give you, I'll give you one example. You know, a lot of, um, a lot of operations in HDFS, uh, they, they leverage renames. Uh, and so they will, um, work on a temporary file. And then after that work is complete, they'll rename it to, you know, what the, the end result file name should be. In HDFS, this is a rename, right? It's a, a simple metadata operation. Uh, but in something like an object store, uh, it is a copy and then a delete. Uh, so it's a lot more I.O. intensive, and that translates into it taking longer. Um, and so with Aluxio, uh, again, there's a lot of different optimizations, uh, but what we're able to do is essentially buffer those temporary files in, in memory uh, so that we're not doing any operations against the object store. Uh, and then when it comes down time to do the final rename, we're able to asynchronously persist that to the object store. And, and that has a couple benefits. Uh, one, the application is not waiting, you know, for this thing to finish. And if you're talking about persisting, you know, multiple gigabytes uh, or terabytes of data, uh, that it could be waiting for a very long time. Uh, and two, you know, you're not, uh, again, bound by, you know, how long this is going to take uh, against a slower um, uh, storage mechanism. Uh, and so there, there, there's benefits to, to both of those. But, uh, uh, does that help answer the question, Peter? I, I, I hope so. <laughs> okay, I think the final question that we the final question we have is, does this, I think the person's referring to Aluxio, have advantages in the non-hybrid cloud configuration? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, we spent the focus on this, uh, you know, on that exact pattern. And while it's something that a lot of people are doing, uh, there's, there's plenty of people that are, uh, again, looking to leverage uh, and get, you know, some better performance, whether they're all in cloud or whether they're, you know, just in a data center. And so I'd say that hybrid cloud, uh, obviously, Alexio has a lot of benefits, but there's still benefits using Alexio, whether you're all in cloud, you know, EA is uh, all in cloud. Um, there's benefits whether, you know, you just go in data to center to data center like Adobe is, 
uh, and not actually leveraging cloud itself. Um, but but yes, there's there's definite benefits to you know leveraging Alexio, including that that migration from HDFS, like we talked about a little bit earlier. There might be one more. Oh, what are the basic requ requirements for installing Alexio? I can answer that. You need the Alexio code. I can I can start with that, right? <laughs> but after that. <laughs> Yes, yes, you need the Alexio packages as a basic, but you know it, it's it's pretty simple uh, in terms of the install itself. So you need some the basic resource from the machine, uh, some place to store data, uh, depending on what you're using. It might be memory, it might be SSD, it might be spinning disk. Um, but the basic requirements from just a hardware perspective, you know, I'd say a machine with uh, four CPUs on it uh, and eight gig of RAM. Uh, that's that's usually a, a fairly basic starting point. Um, but if you're running in a cloud environment, more often than not, you'll be running on something that, that meets the basic requirements to install Luxio on. I think um, the only thing to add to that is that if you check our website, you know, we've got getting started guides uh, for all kinds of different environments. You know, if you're running this locally uh, on Docker, if you're running a Kubernetes cluster, if you're on EMR or Dataproc, uh, if you just want to install it standalone on a Linux machine, you know, we've got guides for all of those things. So if you're looking to get started, um, the, the website could be a great place uh, for figuring out how to, how to go about doing that. And it's, uh, it's pretty simple. Well, that's great, Alex. Thanks a lot. So I think we're at the end of our time today. We want to thank you very much for taking time out in your day to spend time with us. Uh, we hope you found this beneficial, and we would say come to alexio.io to find more information and see when our next seminars are. So with that, have a great day.